we were just talking about what maybe was the most challenging thing about designing the synth. Um, and it seems that we're converging on, we've been converging about the same thing, which is there's a massive amount of parameters and control in here. Thousands. So it's thousands. Like, um, we've been working on like, finishing the full NRPN control of it, and it just goes on and on and on, all those parameters. So what we did want to achieve with the synthesizer was immediate control. Like, like what you have all our other synths. Like, you can sit in front of it, you feel at home, and you know almost immediately how to perform and work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the challenge of keeping that immediacy while also allowing quick access to so much depth, um, you know, that balancing act was one of the central challenges of trying to trying to do this. We were we were given the instruction, you know, the uh, the, the goal with this instrument was to um, you know, to, to set the bar higher than it had ever been set for a polysynth. You know, we were told basically just do, take it as far as you can, do as much as you can. Um, and if that was the only goal, like yes, we could have ended up with like a small black box with a two line LCD and 4,000 parameters, and those exist. Um, you know, there's uh, some famous FM synths that that's basically what they're like. Um, and so just having power and just having depth alone doesn't make a compelling musical instrument. It's about how you interact with it, how you interface with it, how how much it connects your you know your creative intentions to to the actions you're able to perform and actually stop and, and figure things out. And so one of the things that was pretty obvious was that we could not provide a single individual direct control for each parameter. So it was Almost well, it was a given that we had to have some kind of a digital interface, a screen, whatever, on there that would provide additional context or additional information. But then the, the difficulty was how do you make this not unwieldy? How do you make people not like spend ages clicking through trying to figure out where they want to be at so that it's almost as immediate as? You know, grabbing for an knob on the front panel. Mm -hmm. And I remember actually, it was not only that, uh, but there was even the specific instruction, you know, hey, your Moog using this can't feel like using a computer. Like it is a computer, it's got a screen, you are literally using a computer, but because you're also using a Moog synth, it cannot feel like a computer. It's got to feel like you're using a musical instrument. And so how to provide all of that, you know, a graphical UI, like, all of the functionality that you get from literally using a computer while not feeling like that's what you're doing was, you know, was a specific stated design goal. Like this has to feel like you're using an analog synth and not, you know, you cannot ever remind you of checking your email or <laughs> your browser or anything like that. Well, there are Easter eggs in there, but people haven't found them yet. That's true. <laughs> we did spend some time on, hey, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that. Anyway, um, yeah, so one of the, like prime, primary guidelines that I think we came up with for this screen that is sitting in the center here is to design the interaction interface so that it's extremely flat. That there is only one access path into it and that you don't spend time diving through menus or trees. And to assist that, it goes hand in hand with a very common hardware button that we introduced, which is new for this synthesizer and the hardware UI of the synthesizer that we call the more button. And it's this like triangular little switch for each module. Yeah, and one of the things we did, again, there, there were many uh, subtle details, the goal of which was to provide almost at a subconscious level orientation of where you are on the instrument so that you always know what to do, even if you haven't, you know, read a manual or even if you can't put it into words necessarily. So this more button, uh, you know, that we created a consistent grammar for it. Every module in which it appears, it's always located in the upper right corner. It has a, a unique shape that's a you know, different size and shape than any of the other buttons. So anywhere that you see it, you're like, ah, okay, I know what that is. And if, and if you're looking at a given module, you know where exactly to look to see if it's gonna be there. And, and so these subtle cues and the consistency of them, the fact that it's, you know, and anytime we introduce something, we, we use the term grammar because it is, 
you know, you're creating an order, a sense of, of how things are organized, and if you're always consistent with that, then the user can internalize it very easily. They won't have to stop and figure it out because if they've seen one example of it, every other example of it is going to conform to those expectations that have been set up. And that's very important in terms of creating usability and, and sustaining flow. So yeah, so, I'm, so the main immediate controls that... Is it still on? Uh, you might have lost power there. Weird. Yeah. It's almost flat. It's flat. It's oh, here you are. <laughs> so it seems that someone did think this top was massive. <laughs> <laughs> charge Actually, that's coach. probably the same battery that was low last night. Oh, oh there we go. This, this one's flat. Yeah. And then we've got a spare. Um, so, obviously there's a whole bunch of performance controls that people are used to, which are the physical models. Um, and these are present, like we decided which ones would be the ones that people would want to use without actually referring to the screen. And you will, you will recognize these controls as being the ones that, that are consistent across many of our instruments. Um, but additionally, what people really want nowadays when you have a screen is to have a visual confirmation of even those performance controls. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the more panel, you tap on this little switch here, we came up not only with a uniform path to access that screen, we also came up with a uniform layout for it that splits it out in very distinct sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so every time you're looking at any of these extra UI pages, the more pages that we call, as we call them, um, you can always see in the upper left there's going to be some graphics, some visual representation of something that you're changing or some behavior of that module that you're looking at. And in the bottom section, there is always going to be parameter, extra parameters that you can adjust that are laid out in a very consistent way. Uh, and in a way that's designed to sort of merge into the panel itself with the uh, soft knobs. These are multifunction, uh, they're endless pops. They're actually not rotary coders, they're analog <coughs> potentiometers. Uh, but the point being that those are sort of part of uh, you know, what we call the hard UI versus the soft UI, the physical knobs and switches, and there's just a continuous, the labels for those physical knobs just happen to be on a screen and can change depending on what, what page you're looking at, but it very much has the feel of grabbing a knob, seeing the, the label on it, turning it just like anywhere else on the panel. We sort of brought that into this more flexible digital living. And the, the other consistency that we came up with, so you've got, it's, it's a shame that we can't project this one. I'm going to try to describe this if you haven't seen the UI before. Um, so the upper left corner that Ames described is a graphical representation, not a real-time one, because one of the challenges that we realized was that this is polyphonic synth. So many of the controls will be individually, have an individual shape for each voice that's playing. Right, the LFOs, the envelopes, for example, all can be doing independent motion per each voice. So intuitively, for instance, we would be like, okay, let's blink this LFO LED that is here, and then like, oh, but it doesn't match up with... And there are actually 16 LFO ones inside the instrument, and they can all be at you know, going at different rates or at different times. So that's sort of, I think that's a really nice um, example of how, like the intention of the designer is, I want to provide as much information as possible, but if you do that, it would actually become unusable. Right. Because you can't physically display 16 little LEDs for each other phone here. So, one of the things that I consider part of good UI design is to really make good choices in the compromises that you make. Mm -hmm. It's decide what will elevate the performance of the musician, not distract him, and still give enough visual or like physical clues so that the interface and the workflow um, just as natural. Right, yeah, I mean, you feedback, feedback is important generally, but something that we consider a lot is, um, you know, the nature of that feedback, how much of it to provide, because there is such a thing as too much, as Gary was saying, and when to provide it, and the timing of that. It could be, as a musician, uh, getting feedback that is, um, you know, either real time, or at the very least, it has some very intuitively understandable relationship to your action, the confirmation that you get. Um, being consistent in those kind of interactions, providing, providing the right information at the right time, 
is you know is a design process figuring figuring out what what's going to feel the best and be the most uh, the most intuitive in terms of the feedback that you provide. And you know, the, the process of doing that, like, what I found that works really well is really collaborating with each other. Yeah. We riff off of each other all the time, riff off of each other, like other people in the team. And sometimes, like, I remember locations where, like, this doesn't feel right, but we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And then, like, let it sink in and take some time to stand back, try some other things, but not rush into, hey, let's just. Add more stuff. Let's add more buttons. Let's add more labels. Let's add more graphics. Because in the end, that will just overwhelm and not reinforce the like the user experience. Yeah, yeah. It really is. It's like a distillation process. And uh, what you were saying about um, something just not feeling right, paying attention to that is one of the most important things that we do. Uh, is just just sort of sitting with the experience and looking for what are those little points of friction, even if you don't, and very often you don't know why you're experiencing a point of friction. That's to be, you know, that's a research project. All you know is you're like, eh, there's something, something is itching my brain about this process. And so then you sit with that and figure out because there's there's something there, you know, your subconscious is telling you to pay attention and you, so you have to figure out why or what it, what it is. And sometimes it can be something extremely subtle, like that something should be to the left of something else that it relates to instead of above it or below it, you know, for some reason. Maybe it relates to time. And so, you know, we think of time as a horizontal axis more than a vertical axis. axis. And it's like, you know, you, you really, it takes, it, it takes digging into, uh, what your expectations are and what your preconceptions are to unearth things like that. But spending the time to do that is is something that I think um, has really benefited our designs. It has. I'm really happy at like how we were able to take that time, even though it <laughs> made us like there were some <laughs> pressures and stressors in the end. But like we really like did what Ava said. Like that doesn't feel right, so we can continue with that part, but we don't know what to do. It's just not right. We'll work on something else and then we'll circle back around to that. Maybe we'll figure it out, figure it out. Or maybe solve another problem. We'll like peel away the layer of the onion and, and reveal a solution to some previous problem that was mysterious at the time. So another thing that we added to this instrument, so we've got the main LCD here, but also have three OLED displays here. Um, one of the reasons for that was that Turns out that if you want to manipulate, so these are the oscillator sections where you have different waveforms that you can mix together. It's actually really convenient to have con consistent and constant confirmation of what those wave shapes look like. Mm -hmm. Because they're so variable and there are multiple controls that affect the overall wave shape. So adjusting, you know, there, there are two or three knobs that. Uh, are all interactive with each other to control the final wave shape. It's not the sort of thing that you can just easily hold in your head. So having visual confirmation, it takes you know mental work away from the person designing the sound. They don't, instead of having to hold in their head, oh, I'm turning this knob and it's going to be different because this other knob is in this position. You just instantly see, and you know seeing is understanding. And it's you know, then, you're, then you're just playing and having fun. It's not working. <laughs> totally. <sighs> Okay, so this is the part where <laughs> right that was that was the broad overview. Yeah. Um, and so we in in talking last night, like okay, maybe we're going to do this talk after all. Um, one of the things that we realized is aha, Q and A can save our bacon. That's what we can do in real time. Um, so we may potentially have reached um, the end of all the stuff that it was on the top of our heads at the moment. Um, you know, broadly speaking. We're a couple of guys who have spent, you know, half a decade refining this instrument, and now it's out and we can talk about it. And pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, if anyone does have any questions about anything associated with that process, um, please, by all means. Yes, sir. I remember David talking about the value of uh, the increased bandwidth that he has available to him now in his current generation of for his new instrument. I wonder, um, with all the parameterization that you have to deal with, the fact that you're, I'd love to know if it's possible, but 
Well, we're actually literally still wrapping our heads around that. Um, even as recently as this week or last week, that specific issue, how many messages can we push over this connection you know, per second, um, as we were talking about implementing mini control of like all of these thousands of parameters, uh, it became immediately relevant. Like, oh, can we blast out controls for all of this stuff at full bandwidth? And it, that is a real consideration. Um, you know, Generally speaking, I would say we tried to start with um, enough of an overhead, enough capacity that probably as powerful a system as we imagined we might design would be supported, but inevitably that, you know, when it, when that became real, you know, when the rubber hit the road, that was, you know, we had to make trade-offs. So we had to say, oh, well, okay, we can only have, you know, five simultaneous effects. We wanted to have nine or something like that. And, um, you know, so you come up with a speculative design, you have a pretty good idea based on experience of what that is, what, what it's going to take to do that. Um, and then you try to design in a little bit of extra capacity because you're going to get it wrong and, and need, you know, you'll need that extra capacity. Um, and then, you know, you iterate, you, you, hit, you hit a performance limitation, you figure out if it's a real limitation or if you just need to rearrange the furniture a little bit to make it work. Um, and, and you repeat them. It's a, it's a constant part of the part of the process. Another, another thing that helps with that is the fact that this is a very layered architecture that is extremely modularized. So you can focus on individual systems and you have clear barriers of how they're isolated from other systems. So whenever there's a performance um, bottleneck, you can just dive in at that level and then see, okay, what is necessary to get it past that, that point? A like, basic example that is just like, if you would be streaming, so you want, you want audio to react immediately. Like you turn it off, and even though it's going through this entire system, you want to hear it immediately because your ear is super fine-tuned to the slightest little change, but your eyes are not. So you will be changing the refresh rate of what will happen on the screen independently of the refresh rate of what happens in the audio domain. And then even there, there's even a trade-off, like does everything have to update at 30 frames per second on the screen? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it is a control that is slower. It can actually slow it down to 15 frames per second and no one will notice. Um, other things are like um, trying to reduce the impact of changes so that performance only affects what is necessary. For instance, we could like generate all the graphics all the time for all the parameters, but that would overload the system. But still, we want to find a way for when you go to a module to that more page, that the user immediately sees what they want to see. So there's that trade-off that always comes into play. And interestingly, like what we said, we have way more bandwidth but it also means that we've got way more bottlenecks because it, it's an exponential amount of information that goes through here. So it's awesome to have that power, but you know, with great power comes great frustration. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great complexity. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, about uh, a year or so ago, I saw you talking about working with the software interface that lets you emulate things mm -hmm. as a tremendous discount in development. Is Can you now admit this was the thing you were working on and could you talk about that? Because that sounded like a real breakthrough where you could emulate without having to build the hardware. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was this. And we had, there were a couple of iterations. Um, you know, there was a desktop application that was the entire front panel and left hand controller of this instrument, like a little floating windows that you could move around. Um, it actually had them on touch screens, like big touch screens. Mm -hmm. Instead of having the physical mm -hmm. interface, we had touch panels where that virtual front panel would be available. And the really cool thing about that was that virtual front panel was interfacing with the real actual UI code that we were developing that was going to run on the instrument itself. So without, and you know, the only piece of hardware that they needed was like a Linux system, essentially. 
Um, and then we could build this virtual front panel, and it wasn't interacting with like a mock-up. We, we weren't throwing away work. It was we were doing the real work on the actual UI that was done around on the hardware, but we could control it and get a sense of what it was going to be like to interact with before the hardware you know was even was even ready. And then additionally, there's just this one of my pet peeves: the, the fact that we were able to that we decided so it was independent and had boundaries that were closely tied into this particular device allowed us during development to set up a whole testing system. So um, we've got, I don't know how many, it's like 15,000 automated tests running on the software that exercise all the inputs, which would be the same inputs as the virtual front panel is using, but also the real front panel is using, like common protocol. We also, like, devise the system to analyze what actually happened so that we could see if the interactions actually had the desired parameter change results. But also built in a system that allowed us, allowed us to evaluate what would be displayed on screen without being tied to the actual physical, uh, design, like where is everything positioned on the screen, more like semantic testing of does this value display and does it have the intended uh, value displayed on on that spot, not where is it, but does it have the intent of available to the user? And, and what that meant is that multiple developers could be working on this system, you know, distributed all over the world, and anytime anyone makes a change, that change is automatically tested. The impact of that change on the system is tested. And so, you know, if, if they broke something, you know, they know right away, and their collaborators can know right away, and, um, you know, that's been immensely helpful in terms of having a you know stable a stable project that a lot of people are contributing to in real time. Testing as we go, is testing. Yes, sir. But testing sounds really cool, and it's pretty unusual for synth developers to be talking about. <laughs> so you know, it's fun. Um, all of them. Um, yeah. Have you had similar uh, unit tests for like the control path and signal path of the synth too, like to detect? Oh crap. We just inadvertently messed up the envelope timing or the LFO. Some of it. Like, not as much as we'd like. Mm. Um, we're, st we're still improving that part, but it's, it's more tricky because it's running on the meta system. It's, it's not as easy to isolate. Um, but we're actually in the process of, of picking some of these pieces apart so that this whole architecture becomes more stable and stable over time, and that we have more of these testing points um, that provide us with confidence. What do you mean by meta system? I think I think you said meta system. It's running on no embedded system. Oh, embedded. Okay. Yeah. Although I mean, if I could just riff on that for a moment, uh, there is a sense in which we've designed this as a meta system, in that it is made of building blocks. At a very fundamental level, this is a synthesizer construction kit that, um, you know, the, a, the space of all possible synthesizers that could uh, be implemented using this hardware, using these software tools, um, you know, not only is it, it, you know, it's truthful to say that this is a platform that can be extended in a lot of directions, but it was very much designed that way from the beginning. It was, you know, there is, there is a very flexible language for specifying and implementing a general synthesizer sort of baked into this project and, and uh, that was you know that was foundational to the effort to begin with. Yeah. Yes sir? Yeah I was wondering the architecture the way you built this is what you see the knobs and everything is that a like a control panel that does just that that sends signals to a bus that then has the controllers and the actual creation of sounds for the, the VCS and so forth underneath it. Is that fully decoupled? Um, yes, yes. Um, you know, as opposed to something like the Matriarch or the Grandmother, where many of the potentiometers are right in the middle of the analog circuits that they control, they, they're inseparable. Uh, this is entirely a control surface. And, um, you know, the synthesizer, uh, the synthesizer voice, um, the voices exist on separate physical cards. They have their own separate microprocessors that are doing things like generating control voltages and receiving, you know, bus messages from the central CPU. So it's a, it's a distributed network of, of, of smaller systems that, um, 
you know, some of which are responsible for actual analog synth circuits, and many of which are responsible for logic and control and distributing uh, all that information to the network of voices. This cycles back to your question. Like, having that feel, analog, that was really hard. Right, because it goes through so many right. sub subsystems, yeah, you get, you get right. and you're actually like latency, and you're like hundreds, hundreds of steps removed from turning up, a, 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 you know, changing a resistor in the middle of a filter. You know, instead you're, you know, you've got a whole Goldberg machine in between you and what you hear, but it's still got a feeling. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I, I have two more. I have plenty. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can, you can dip. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, that is a very familiar sensation that you're describing. And did we ever design ourselves into a corner? Oh, yeah. with it. <laughs> all, the, all the time. Um, I can. There's one particular example that comes to mind right now. Um, I'm not. Uh, maybe there's. A, maybe we've come up with a solution for this. I'm not 100 percent sure. But uh, the modulation matrix is something that's very important to this instrument. It's you know you have with all these thousands of parameters. How cool is it to be able to move them all around dynamically while you're playing? Um, and the ability to shape the fine contours of that modulation is really the heart of what lets you do amazing, unique sound design that you can't do in other instruments. So, uh, one of the facilities in the mod matrix is a thing we call transforms. And if any of you are familiar with the Kurzweil K2000 VAST synthesizers, they have things called funds. These are just functions. They're mathematical functions that you can do. You know, you've got an input, and maybe it's an envelope, maybe it's a mod wheel you're moving, whatever it is, it's a thing that you you have some input control over, and then you've got some destination, some aspect of the sound that's going to change. And then the function that you put in between those two things lets you shape it. It lets you curve or bend or lag or sample and hold. It's like all of the extra, you know, it's like effects, putting effects on your modulation, essentially. Uh, and so we want to do that too because it's really useful to, like if you've got a mod wheel, maybe you don't want it to have a linear effect on something, maybe you want it to have an exponential effect on something. How do you do that? You take the mod wheel, you put an exponential function, then you put whatever the thing is that you want the mod wheel to be in control of. So getting back to designing myself into a corner, we have this UI that's physically, there are four soft knobs, and those correspond to kind of naturally four columns of information that you can edit. And so when we designed the mod matrix, we want to put everything into the same, we had to use the same physical controls because that's the, the controls that we had. And uh, so we were left with a situation where the U, all the rules of the UI that made perfect sense everywhere else right up until that point resulted in there was only one knob that we could use to adjust one parameter for this transform function. And mostly that's okay, but there are, but except where it isn't. There are so many uh, functions that would be amazing to have two parameters that you could adjust. It would just open, open up the whole world. And literally the only reason you can't do it is just because of the constraints of the UI, not because you know, the whole rest of the system is fully capable of doing it. And so that's just a simple design into a corner situation. Maybe there's a way out. So I have some notes on it. Yeah. But I think, I think we're not stuck yet. Yeah. Like, I but, have this yeah, feeling, we, we've had other occasions, but I have a feeling that it's just going to take time until we figure it out. Right, and that's one of those things where, you know, uh, very often something like that will remain a problem, and then you'll just think of it like, oh, if I hold this button and press, you know, turn this knob, like, that's the perfectly intuitive move to make the thing happen, and, you know, like, you get, you get unstuck when you figure out some new approach. But, like, to go back to the beginning of what we were talking about, the advantage of that design that we came up with is that we design a very capable and complex, like capable of complex modulations, mod matrix that is flat. Like people can just scroll through, they immediately see what is going on. There is no menu diving or like, okay, I'm going into this and then to tweak one parameter, go back out. They just see exactly what is going on, go straight to the thing that they want to change and change it. So if we made the design decision initially, hey, menu diving is fine, let's put in hierarchical menus, then we would not have had the problem I was just describing, but we also wouldn't have that wonderfully frictionless, flat, you know, nice navigation experience, uh, which ultimately that was, you know, that was a worthy goal and, and we did succeed there. And just because you have to get a little bit creative around it in the corner cases. And so 
one of the nice examples, I still remember this conversation, like three and a half, four years ago, we've got this mod matrix where we actually have in each line more than four parameters because you select the source, the controller, the transform, the destination, but then also the values are those. Like amounts. So amounts. Yeah. It, I don't know how many iterations it took before. It was like, aha! If you press the encoder, and then you switch to another line, and you can still display all the information, and it feels very natural. But it, I think it took months, oh, years, yeah, before we so came up with that simple move. Right, and then it's like, ah, this unlocks everything, yep. it works. Yeah. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, the first thing I, I, I was in front of this, of this beautiful instrument, I said, like, it's the best app ever. <laughs> you know, let, let, let me let me like explain a little bit because you talk about uh, yesterday about like the like the like the level levels like one level of, of deep of the of the parameters. Mm -hmm. So as you you think like that like you design an app and then design like the like the hardware to 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 be part of that app mm -hmm. you know like because yeah uh, and, and 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 then the other question is like is is is, is this really the future because the this digital control like analog oscillators. Could be like we can design apps and then someone else in in the other part of the world could design our instrument for that. Mm -hmm. Like, is, is this a, the future? Maybe <laughs> I, I think it is a possible future. Certainly, um, that concept of being able to collaborate over great distance on something that's ultimately going to be integrated hardware and software. Um, I think that has never been more possible than it is now. It's becoming a more of an easy thing. Um, I think there's an example of that in uh, the world recently. I'm trying to remember, I'm drawing a blank now on which very recent synthesizer it is. I think it's a Korg item. Um, but you can load your own oscillator modules on there, and like they've drawn from the Mutable Instruments open source community. And so this is a hardware synth that you can buy and say, aha, I have an idea for a different sounding oscillator. I'm, and, and you can load it up, and there it is inside your hardware instrument. Um, and they've, you know, by embracing open source, they've made it so that, you know, anybody can do that. You don't have to go to their oscillator store and buy new oscillators. You can, you can just go to GitHub and download one. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, so I think that we will see more of that, more things like that, and more ability for people to sort of take design into their own hands and extend something, uh, but in a way that was, is, you know, not, uh, that, was, that was planned for, that, that was all provided for in, in the first place to be able to do that. So I had something to, like, to say about building an app that like, makes or like, simulates what the interaction would be. There is something very different about having it fully digital and touching it. There's going to be a bunch of things that you think will work out, but they don't. Uh, it could be as, it could be as, like, Weird as oh, but that thing is obstructing that LED. Or I I thought I could reach this, but that thing is in the way. Or like on the app, you can actually control multiple things at the same time, but in reality, not because you have physical limitations. So I think it facilitates part of the design, but it can also make you. Um, make decisions that will not necessarily translate to the final version. Yeah, actually that's a really good point about the LEDs. When we designed this looking at a top-down, you know, flat image of the control panel, things look a certain way. But then in reality, it's tilted back at this angle, physical knobs stand up, and they're opaque. So they're, you, they, your line of sight is obscured in a certain direction by the knobs. <coughs> And you simply, you know, unless we simply didn't grasp that until it, we were looking at the physical, the reality of it, and we thought, oh, we should maybe move those LEDs a little left or right of where they are. But it was, you know, uh, that was it. Take it took coming from the virtual into the physical to to have that realization. Yeah. And so, when you guys first were charged with this, obviously monument, this task, what were some of the inspirations that you guys draw from, and does the finished product? meet, exceed uh, your expectations initially, or is it so far out from what you guys initially thought about when you first started doing this? Hmm. I, there was a notion very, very early on in the genesis of this project 
that we would just do something simple. That it would just be a simple, you know, three oscillator polysynth with a big sweet spot, not a lot of controls, just a gigging musician's polysynth. Uh, we obviously didn't do that. <laughs> um, and, and there were reasons. I mean, I, that that product that I just described, I think, you know, there are other people making things like that. There's room for us to still make something like that. That's that's all fine and well. But it had been so long since there had been a mode polysynth. And it was going to be such a big darn deal to make one that we thought, like, if we're going to do it, let's let's go all the way. Let's really, you know, just make it make it the ultimate. Um, and so that was actually a change in the you know the initial design was not that. And so that probably added three years to the project easily or something like that. Uh, but it was the right move. I think it was the right thing. It was, this was the right first polysynth for mode to make after thirty years. Um, but. At that point, then we had to sort of reconsider a lot of things. Like, oh, okay, well, that's going to have implications for how big it is and how much stuff goes on the panel and, and what our budget even is. You know, like, oh, our our, our cost of materials budget just got higher. <laughs> um, and um, and yeah, so that was I I I may have drifted away from the thread of your original question, but that's okay. Are you guys? Obviously, oh, oh, yeah. What were the inspirations, and uh, did we think we? I'm very happy with what we ended up with. It it, it it does exceed my expectations, even after the point where we were told to set our sights higher. I think I think we we met or exceeded that goal. Um, inspiration wise, it's a lot of things. Obviously, if you've ever seen a memory mode, it's yeah. visually immediately. Um, and there were a number. We went through a number of visual designs that were completely different. Some of the first. Uh, possible renders of what a what this instrument might be. You know, they were like super sleek and minimal, and like all like reflective black surfaces, and you know, looking looking more like some futuristic sci-fi thing. And you know, a ton of different different options. And ultimately, we thought like, yes, it's going to be a futuristic sci-fi thing on the inside. And we, and so the way to sell that, the way to, the way to convince people that Moog can do crazy futuristic sci-fi stuff when they're this like, you know, vintage American company is by cueing immediately and reinforcing that we had not forgotten the legacy, that we, you know, that this was gonna give you the warm fuzzy things that a memory mode would give you and also blow your mind with sci-fi high tech stuff, but but all of that in a package that's that's you know warm and legacy and you know, so there was, there was a lot of balancing of like what's the psychology of this instrument in addition to what's the usability. Yes? On the development side, when you talked about the effects of the knobs getting in the way of LEDs and looking at it top down, how's that affecting your next workflow, next 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 iteration? When you get everything there? is always affecting everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, do, constantly. Do you, do you ever consider, do, you know, what's your paper to the digital uh, design process? Do you use SolidWorks? Do you use CAD? Do you, we do use all of those things. Uh, I mean, solid, SolidWorks specifically, yes. Um, uh, there are a number of other ones as well. That's not. I'm not so much on the industrial design side myself, but we are constantly iterating with our industrial design folks. Uh, a lot of things, you know. I'm an old-fashioned pen and paper person. Like I've got the notebooks full of sketches, uh, and typically those rough sketches then get turned into like cleaner digital sketches, which gives us. That's like the cheap and easy way to move things around and rough things in and get a decent idea. And we'll all get together and we'll talk it over. We'll say, you know, how does this look? How does this feel? Maybe we do this, maybe we do that. So you do that a bit, and then you take the time to put it into SolidWorks and make a 3D model. And even then, you still can move things around. And Similar. exactly, yeah. So you know, start start with a stick figure, and uh, you know, then do a slightly better drawing, and then do a render, and all at every stage, you're reassessing and evaluating. And, Amongst ourselves, but also physically simulating. Even even though it might not be like the knob that is attached to something, it's like okay, we did a sketch, we simulated digitally, but now let's actually look at the shape of yeah. what it looks like. Let's put it out in front of us. Does that knob there feel right? Does this layout feel yeah. right? Like does it feel accessible, intuitive? Actually, when you go and interact with it, even though it doesn't do anything, but just having like this styrofoam thing and you plug things in and then show me. Yeah, we, we, we used uh, multiple of our last couple since we've used the very high tech approach of foam <laughs> port board with push pins with, with mode knobs <laughs> sitting on them. <laughs> and like that, and it lets you okay. Here, here, here you can kind of just like, you know, pantomime using the instrument and figure out if it feels right. 
because talking talk about this, I was wondering why you're still using resistor, you know, parts instead of encoders, because they would then be able to show you what the parameters are if you recall a preset, and that was done, right? Mm. Uh, well, there are a few reasons, like the little fatty from a long time ago did have, uh, you know, an LEDs around every one, but there were only four. There were only four. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, part of it is cost and complexity. Uh, if you were to have, say, 15, 15 is a good number of LEDs, it gives you decent resolution. If you were to have 15 LEDs on 80 knobs, um, it's very expensive, the electronics to individually control all of those, the space that it takes up. Now, I have had some ideas for panels that integrate that kind of feedback per knob in a way that's maybe less expensive and complex, but it's still like, that's a research project, it's a huge undertaking, and mostly, like, especially if you're in a dark room and you know where all the knobs are on your instrument because you've practiced with it a lot, um, it's not a deal breaker to not have that feedback. The tactile feedback of grabbing a knob and knowing where, you know, this is better feedback for a musician more of the time. And, and so we get that for free with, with the knobs and, and, uh, and it's enough. But, I, but that is something that I do think about because it is good and how do you do that in a way that uh, you know, solves the various problems in here and in trying to make that solution scale up to a big pair. Um, yes. Um, the tech question, not really UI related, but the oscillators are really something special and uh, has that digital control over the analog core. Right now, it seems like it's kind of slope and reset and basically those are Kind of uniformly periodic. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to reset those at kind of different rates? Maybe reading slope and reset. Theoretically, the yes. There are. Uh, there's actually a, a paper published internally in the not like out in academia land, but um, you know Cyril Lance, who spent a lot of time working on those oscillators. There are design documents that suggest other modes in which they can operate that do more complicated stuff like wave folding and you know, multi-segment PLUM of pulse waves. And so yes, there are there's there are layers and levels of complexity that that core technology would additionally allow. And uh, we made the decision not to uh, base this implementation around those extended modes because it's more, you know, it's another research project that we hadn't, you know, we had enough. Yeah, we, we had, had enough, enough to do. To do. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, okay, like third, third and fourth and fifth oscillator modes, maybe later. We know we know we can probably do it. You know, this instrument doesn't need to have those things. Uh, but I am very excited about exploring those aspects of technology in the future. It is it is theoretically possible. Yeah, because they're like very subtle like implications, like. Relatively late in the process, I think we realized that we actually had to have a dedicated saw mode. Yeah. But while we thought we could get along with a variable sweeping triangle mode, but we could never get that like very fast reset and getting that buzzy sound. Yeah, the, really the crispiest ring mode sawtooth has a super fast reset time, and so that it required a special mode in order to, to get it to behave in that way. It was different. It wasn't. It wasn't on the continuous spectrum with the other behaviors that it does, so we had to add a mode. And, and ultimately, that was an example of, you know, there's a switch, there's a physical switch on the panel that was added very, very late. Like, we thought we were done. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we like, all right, no more spins, no more hardware revisions, we're done. And then we ultimately, yeah, for the, yeah, we realized for the good of the instrument, like, no, we have to add, we have to rip up, redo, add a physical switch, it's, the instrument needs it. And you know, and so we, we just accepted the extra delay and the extra expense of doing that late stage revision because it was necessary. A lot of things that you think are like, trivial or obvious turn into huge research projects. So <laughs> going to other oscillator modes, like okay, well maybe like somewhere in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll definitely be months of work. Yes. A quick question that you waiting for a while. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you go first. Oh, thanks. You're also blind, by all means. Yes, very, very much so. Yeah. Um, and and I would say even because part of our MO and you know my own uh, specifically for sure 
is to always, whenever I have the opportunity, talk to musicians who are into synthesizers about their process, about what they're doing. You know, if they use one of our instruments, what do you wish that it could do? You know, what do you like best about it? And where, where do you want to take it from here? All of those conversations, um, you know, I take notes, I, I write things down, and I file it all away. So there are there were conversations with musicians who didn't know that we were going to be doing this that went into the design of this. But also, yeah, 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 there were speculative what ifs, and I would say, hmm, very interesting. <laughs> you know, all that fed into this design process. But also the actual instrument itself, once it was a thing, um, you know, we did send it out to, you know, we have, there are people that have uh, sort of that level of working relationship with us where they, you know, they're under NDA, they are, you know, they're able to provide early feedback on what we've been doing. Um, and that, that is very helpful because there's no way that we can think of everything that this instrument can do. It's too complex. The use cases, the ways people are going to, you know, we, we only know what we know. And so working with other people who are professionals who have, you know, very um, highly refined needs and intentions from their lifetime of practice, uh, getting that perspective is, is very important to, to uh, being as successful at what we do. One example that I really remember is the LFOs. We thought that we could just get away with a single LFO rate, and then like, oh no, we need to add different ranges. But then those ranges were not enough yet, and we added like a third one, and then eventually a fourth one, because like, that particular user had a very compelling like, right. Yeah, we had like slow, medium, and fast ranges, and they were like, "No, I really need a super slow range because I'm scoring for film. I got this ten minute long scene, and I want to know if I like those horns, like <laughs> to build tension through that whole scene." And I was like, "That's actually really yeah. neat." I guess, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and so yeah, now there's like a glacially slow mode with uh, those ten minute LFO cycles, and if you score films, you might find yourself using. <laughs> Or if you just like really long ambient pieces. Uh, yes? So, uh, thinking about light and color, I know Roland has been experimenting with many people shot with you know, the TRAS with all the different colors mm -hmm. and channels and JDXA, which has a more applied interface to like six different instruments. All yeah. the parameters are still the same they've been using since the XP80. Or you know the system eight, which was Xbox green lighting. Oh yes. And did you? And I, the, the, the one is very classic. And it retains the mode. You have room for your fingers. The knobs are human sized, and it remains very kind of you know classic in design. Did you um, consider lighting at all in the process of going with that way to kind of expand the interface um, output? For the, the player. Well, I can say the original uh, the original LEDs were a kind of a seafoam green kind of aqua color. Uh, we thought better of that, ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yes, uh, color and both the psychology of color and, as you're suggesting, the extra layers of information that color can convey um, is something that we do think about, although obviously we haven't leaned into it that much yet. And part of that is we have this sort of classic vibe to maintain. If there's, you know, I think it's very important to push in, you know, to remain innovative and push things into the future without losing that. And that's gonna be an interesting balancing act. Um, yeah, I think we haven't done anything that does has dynamic, you know, RGB LEDs, anything like that yet. Would we? I, it would have to be, I mean, yes, if it felt right, and if it looked right, that's certainly a direction that we could go in. Um, you know, as it is, I think we mostly just confined our talk about lighting to the two, the two things. One is accessibility for people that have color perception issues. Like, we do think about that. Like, we don't make something critical that's distinguished by an LED being one or two, one of two colors that a lot of people can't discern between. Uh, you know, that's design mistake. Uh, but other than that, just sort of like, what's the overall vibe? I remember uh, a lot of our products have sort of a warm amber LED color, and that was chosen very intentionally to be kind of retro and nostalgic and pleasant and easy on your eyes in a dark room, and it just feels nice. It just has a nice vibe to it. And that was, you know, that was the design consideration that led to that choice. Yeah, at one point even, like, we were hesitant about actually putting an LCD in there because of the light that it emanates. So we floated the idea, but couldn't like really make it work to have sort of like a Kindle 
screen there that would not emanate light but would feel like it's physical part of the instrument. But that seemed too too much of a research task. Yeah, again, again. Yeah. But like it was more going away from that so that it would feel like a tangible object and and not a series of multicolored lights that might not necessarily um, uh, make to make musician more confident about using the instrument. We did ultimately add the ability to dim yeah. all the panel LEDs, even set the LED brightness, because some people like working in absolute pitch blackness, and other people not so much, and they need different different light levels. And that's like, as a you know, for the performer, that's actually really important. It's like it, it makes the instrument unusable sometimes if there's you know too much light coming out of it. I've had that complaint. Yes. <clears throat> I really enjoyed uh, your approach to marketing it and like you to talk about how did you decide when you have to draw a line to get out the door and also I want to acknowledge the fact you're right, you're right, you're right. And, and the other thing was just uh, so many companies today push things out the door and they're underdeveloped and to me what you did is you were transparent it's still work in progress. And I, I want to acknowledge that because I really think that's something that builds more integrity. You know, I've heard someone say, "Why? well, why didn't they have it all working correct? And I responded, nobody has it all working correct. They're just <laughs> lying to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly and if you true. talk about that a little bit, yeah. because that's clearly a decision you yeah. made. Being transparent about where we were in the design process and you know how things were going yeah. and, and how far we still had to go was a very conscious decision um, you know, number one, because that's that was the reality and there was no getting away from it. Mm -hmm. And number two, because, yeah, we want to maintain goodwill. We want to, you know, we want people to uh, sympathize with us and mm -hmm. root for us as we as we do this work. And being open about it, being saying, hey, we're, you know, we're only humans and this is where we're at and this is where we intend to take it and we're passionate and committed and we hope you'll, you know, join us for the ride. Uh, people respond really well to that because they don't feel like you're playing any kind of tricks on them. And, you know, they can decide for themselves. Some people have said, hey, that's really cool and all, and I'm, I'm rooting for you, but I'm, I'm not going to buy it. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. see you next year, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's great because otherwise those same people might have jumped on it and then spent a month writing horrible things about you all mm -hmm. over the internet because you, you betrayed them and frustrated them. And, like... You know, that a lot of times people that are like the nastiest and meanest online, it's actually coming from a place of passion, mm -hmm. frustrated passion. And if you reach out to those people and say, hey, you know, I feel you, I see what you're going through, let me talk to you about that. A lot of times those same people like, you know, it's just like flipping a switch. They become your, your staunchest advocates because you've connected with them and you care and they care and you're on the same page. And so if you can avoid the part where they've written a bunch of nasty things about you on the internet and then you get in touch with them, if you can just, you know, level with them from the outset, then you can create a good, uh, you know, good dynamic. And that has served us really well. Uh, every time we do a firmware update, myself or someone like me does a live stream. It goes online and says, hey, this is, here's the new stuff. Here's what we know doesn't work, you know, and, and we're just really candid about it. And it's gone from like, before we, it was a while between the last update and the most recent one, and people started to get grumpy about it online, and and you know they were you know, like the, just the mood had turned dark and pessimistic, and then we did a live stream and we're like, hey, here's some new stuff. Here's we these, these things work, these things don't work, but we're working, we're actively developing them. This is what to expect, roughly speaking. Don't hold us to it. Um, just like the sun came out and the birds were singing and everybody was cool and singing kumbaya and it was just like, it was awesome. it's great. So just, just being open and honest about what we're doing and how we're doing it is, has been a tremendously winning strategy for us yeah. in terms of public perception and, and just the goodwill that we, that we have for the people that care about what we're doing. Yeah, and it's also like being along for the ride with the customers has yeah. been amazing. Because we, look, we've been collaborating with musicians before it was released. But getting it at that next level of adoption, like getting hundreds of people actually using it and giving us feedback really brings out different elements that maybe we had, hadn't like noticed before or paid as much attention to before, or maybe not prioritized as much because we thought maybe we'll do this first because we think that's more important. But in the end, no, like the users ask for something else. So maybe sometimes going too far and designing the whole thing with a certain mindset 
might not make it as good as it could be. Like getting all that user feedback, mm -hmm. you think really makes it something that grows over time and makes it become an instrument that is really tailored to a whole yeah. variety of. Uh, the Sub Thirty Seven, I think, was a great example of that because that was an instrument that came out. You know, it was pretty much functional. It was fully functional when it was released. It wasn't like some. It wasn't half baked or anything, but. I was super involved with the user community for the first several years that that instrument was out, and it iteratively became better and better because people were inspired by it and would say, hey, I'm using it this way, I'm, I'm hooking it up to this and this, and I want to do this with it, and, and all of that feedback was able to go into the iterative updates and you know, features were added and behaviors were refined directly because people that were excited about it were getting in touch with us and sharing their experience and sharing what they were doing with it. And we were able to make it a better instrument for that community through their input and their participation. And, and I always want to do that is with, with our designs because it's so, you know, the end, yeah, it's really gratifying for us. It's gratifying for the people on the other end who are using it and you end up with better instruments. And this is like first for us, like polysynth and all those capabilities, assuming that we knew what it had to be and finish everything, and this is the finished final product that we're never going to change. Probably not going to be able to do that correctly just by no, we were not experts in making policy. Yeah, so we're still not. We're still better. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the design of the instrument. I'm just curious. Do you have a, a lot of iterations to go in, in the manufacturing process when you get the first prototype back from and you build that into your schedule? Mm -hmm. you really that. Uh, the answer to your question of do we have to iterate is sadly yes, more than we intend to. And sometimes it's because we have better ideas and refine things, and sometimes it's just due to simple human error, either on our part or on the manufacturer's part or both. Uh, I mean, manufacturing is hard. It's really complicated, it's really difficult, and so many things go wrong all the time. Um, so yeah, there are many hardware iterations, although you know, the better a job we do, uh, we've gotten, uh, we're trying to institute more of a culture of uh, peer review, like all the hardware engineers looking at each other's boards before they go out to the manufacturer and you catch more things that way, just for having different eyes on it. Um, yeah, so, so for many reasons, everything from having new ideas and improving the products to just trying to push something to a working first article that's actually 100% successful, uh, we, we iterate as much on the hardware side as we do on the software side. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, we had the both had the uh, CP two fifty one for the motor motors, mm -hmm. the Voyager expander for the Voyager. Yeah. Uh, the mod maker stuff, the main one stuff, that I think of, and it might be too redundant, but it would be possible to have a hardware expansion that's basically the mod matrix that you can integrate with like the sub. Huh. Well, that would be super neat. Um, the subsequent 37 does have a CD output flavor that it comes in. The mod matrix in this instrument has, I think, four CD outs and like five inputs that, that can be scanned in and contribute to the mod matrix. So uh, there's an extent to which if you have a mode one laying around, you can break out the mod matrix to other hardware already. Uh, the idea of having that as a standalone thing is pretty neat. <laughs> Could get the notebook. <laughs> what are your academic backgrounds and was that important to you? Thankfully, no. To answer your second question first, um, I think it may be the case that neither of us have an advanced degree. Um, we are both largely self taught. I went to NC State for mechatronics, but I did not graduate. I withdrew for medical reasons. I had sleep apnea and epilepsy and stuff like that. Which is thankfully all been taken care of. But uh, essentially, I was already working for Moog when I started down that path of academia. And every uh, the NAMM show basically coincided with finals every year. <laughs> and um, I always had a new product that I had to get ready for NAMM. And after a few years of like, you know, eh, I'm doing the best I can, but like these two classes I'm gonna have to punt on and take them again in the fall. Like, you know, so my, my four year degree became like six or seven years. And at that point I was like, wait a minute, I'm doing this to get a really good job in the music the instrument industry? <laughs> Maybe I already took that one off. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, so eventually I realized that I was already doing everything that I wanted to go to school to be doing. And uh, it was taking up all my time anyway. 
So, uh, yeah, so I have like three-ish years of uh, a, a uh, what, do you, what do you call it, a bachelor of engineering degree, and then 15 years of work experience. Yeah, for me, right on. It like two years of studying architecture and then realizing that I didn't want to become an architect. But that, that those two years still to this day help so much with the whole creative design process. Like, mm -hmm. How do you approach a blank slate? How do you approach abstract ideas and make them into concrete like, realizations? Um, that whole, actually those were two fun years because it's the two years in architecture where it's not real. You can just come up with stuff that no one ever built and it's just not practical. But the whole like creative nature of that is something that really benefited me personally. And then besides that, it's a lot of like self-taught stuff um, coming from a software background from my end, being hugely part of the open source community, contributing, I've contributed so much back, so many different like industries and domains, so many different, like, dozens and dozens of projects, just being inspired and looking at what others are doing and their different approaches, how that translates into final products or just into methodologies, into architectures, and then ultimately into how the design of a product you know, crosses all the layers. That is something that I believe in, that to create a good design, you do have to have an understanding about how things impact all the way through, instead of just focusing on one particular part that's floating on top, because you'll be disconnected of what it will actually become. And use it as a musician, I mean, we're both musicians musical background, I think it's important to design musical instruments. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you have to have to know the domain. With that, I think we're through. Yeah, that's, right, cool. uh, that's all our time. If anyone sure. has a truly pressing question that they really would be sad if they didn't ask before they left, uh, by all means. And otherwise, oh, yes? Was that, okay, that was just, okay. Oh. Right. <laughs> Hit us up. All right, yeah, yeah walking around. Yeah, we'll try. Whoa! Thanks, <laughs> hey. hey,